Greetings, my name is Captain Shack, CO of the Liberation. This series is a field guide how to play the mod Empire at War Awakening of the Rebellion as the Rebel Alliance. My goal is to get you familiarized with Rebel assets and logistical support in ground and space warfare. This hollow vid will be divided into chapters for your convenience, so check the timestamp below if you're looking for a specific topic. Mission log updated. Though this video will go over an extensive list of topics, it is not the end-all be-all of Rebel tactics, technology, or economic will. Just as the Alliance to Restore the Republic is made up of innumerable worlds from all over the galaxy, so too are the tactics we employ. Anyways, let's get started. Installing the mod. Firstly, you'll need to upgrade your command interface. We call this modding. Our base software is Empire at War, but many years ago, an expansion was released called Forces of Corruption, which will be required from Steam to properly run the mod Awakening of the Rebellion. This is a simple task of hitting the subscribe button after heading to the link in the description below. Once both the game and the mod are installed, run the game and select Forces of Corruption when asked. From the main menu, select the options, then mods, and choose the mod you wish to launch. The title will restart and the newly selected mod will be installed. You should see a different splash screen depending on what mod you're running. The version that we'll be discussing today, as of making this video, is All Wings Report In version 2.9. Depending on when you're watching this hollow vid, the version may have changed. These mods are getting constantly updated by a team of highly skilled volunteers. Some have reported issues with images being stretched or squished. This is an issue I personally have, and to fix it, you're going to need to go to Options, Menu, Video, and turn on and off, and then back on, the widescreen mode, after the mod has been launched. When you start your journey, you'll be tasked to choose which simulation you'd like to run, single player, multiplayer, or continue an ongoing campaign of your choice. Multiplayer, though functional, is not the focus of AOTR, nor is it guaranteed to give you the best possible experience. Single player offers Galactic Conquest mode and Skirmish battles. Skirmish is fine, plays to test new battle tactics, but again, not the primary focus of the mod. Galactic Conquest, the primary focus, offers a number of campaigns, difficulties, as well as factions to choose from. We'll be focusing on the Rebel Alliance again for this guide. Difficulty changes the build rates, the artificial intelligence operation behaviors, as well as enemy faction income. The higher the difficulty, the more challenging and brutal the other factions will be. Warning! Expert is much harder than in past simulations. There is no shame in running an easier difficulty till you learn the more intricate mechanics. The campaign types, to the left, offer a wide range of potential conflicts, each with a brief description, number of worlds, general difficulty, factions involved, and starting credits. For instance, if you wish to focus on a war against the Empire and remove any criminal interference, then the Galactic Civil War RE campaign will suit you. Others, such as liberating the Mon Cal homeworld or a core world push to Coruscant, are available with fewer worlds to make a shorter, more direct campaign possible. If you're interested in following the growth of the Rebellion from a single world, review the Random World Start campaigns for a fresh experience. The largest and most intricate campaign, and likely most played, is the Awakening of the Rebellion full campaign, offering story missions, cutscenes, minor and major factions, and is generally considered the true AOTR experience for which we will use this going forward for this guide. Much of what we discussed here will still be relevant for all the other campaign types, so keep that in mind. The Galactic Setting and Map No matter the campaign you choose, you've joined the Rebel Alliance at an interesting time. With the revelation and destruction of the Death Star, this has shocked many across the galaxy. With this news becoming public knowledge, many worlds have openly withdrawn from the Empire, against the better judgment and urgings of Mon Mothma, and are now actively being targeted by the Empire. These worlds will be shown as red on the galactic map. These are your worlds. In our example, these worlds range from poor Outer Rim territories to the rich, more industrialized worlds of the Mid-Rim. They're spread out and disconnected. Using the arrow keys on your keyboard, you can move your perspective, or by moving the mouse to the edge of the screen. Another option is to click the mini-galactic map to center your view on a specific region. First and most important control as a new commander is here, the pause button. Use this to get a handle on your situation and stop time from progressing as this simulation will move quite quickly with weeks flying by, and the enemy will not wait for you to get comfortable with your new position. To the right is the fast forward button, which will speed up the universe simulation. To the top right are icons of known Republic leadership. These heroes of the Rebellion come in all shapes and sizes, each with differing strengths, from the famed Rogue Squadron to the military commander General Riken, or the diplomatic and overwhelmingly capable leadership of Leia Organa, who has become a symbol of hope to the Rebel Alliance. Selecting any of these images will center your view on that unit, no matter where in the galaxy they're located, if they wish to be found. To the bottom left is your general UI. Selecting your astromech will give you the droid logs, letting you go back over any missed information or review many of the icons on the map and what they mean. 
The tabs above will give you graphical data on galactic economy, military growth, and your current occupied planets. The tech tree is long overdue for an update and should generally be ignored. The summary page will show you all of your current assets under your command and their location. This is great for locating missing units deployed to the wrong location or organizing ground and space forces. Under your personal astromech are the main menu key for saving, loading, and adjusting the visual and audio options. This menu can also be found by hitting escape. Question mark is again the droid menu. And lastly, the mission holocron, which is incredibly important button that's easy to overlook. Here you have your current assignments that'll be listed as issued from high command. We'll go over that later in this video. The last option in this row is the cinematic camera, which when the game is unpaused, will send the camera slowly orbiting random worlds, giving you a 3D perspective of the galactic map. This has no function other than looking interesting. To the right is your UI controls. These each show and hide important information on the galactic map. First is planetary credits, which reveals each planet's weekly credit generation, amount, or cost. Second is the planet's capability to support ground structures and space-based shipyards. Light-colored pips show a potential for high-level shipyards that can be upgraded if possible. The lower empty circles show at a glance there are open building slots, while the brighter colored open circles show how many slots are currently full. Every world is limited by how many structures they can have on the surface and how large a space station the local system can support. Stations range from levels 1 through 3, while some areas of space such as intersections and certain uninhabitable planets can have no ground capability at all, while the largest populated worlds can support up to seven different structures on the surface, such as the heavily populated world as Coruscant. Down a row is a button that displays each world's special notable ability. Weather, current corruption details. The last icon raises heroes to the top of the UI, so you can find them at a glance when attached to a fleet or a ground army. This box shows what week has passed since the destruction of the Death Star. The economic information you currently have coming in, including weekly income, which is deposited into your account located here. These numbers here are your population numbers and the cap we can support without further infrastructure. If you find yourself unable to build vessels, vehicles, fighter wings, and you're not sure why and you have the credits on hand, check this number. You may be at your population cap. To the right of this information is a series of filters designed to allow for easier navigation of the building menus to the right. These filter space stations, capital ships, frigates, corvettes, and starfighters. The bottom is the same, but for ground-based buildings and vehicles. Keep in mind, these filters do not function unless the game is unpaused. The two main tabs switch between space and ground when a planet is selected, like so. Selecting a world and rolling the middle mouse wheel forward will zoom in on the planet to give you a more detailed perspective. This menu has a load of information for a new commander showing what forces are currently deployed to the planet's surface, what forces are currently in orbit, located in three fleet slots, what stations are anchored in the system on the left, and what structures are currently on the surface. To the right are the details of the planet with notable effects, such here as Echo Base, aka Hoth, has the ability to remain undetected. What can be built on the world, such as an alliance base or heavy factory, how large a shipyard this ice world can maintain, which isn't anything more than a light factory due to the low population, and what other factions could potentially do with this planet if it falls into the wrong hands. Notable features on this screen are base layout buttons, which gives the command overview of base defenses, structures, unit deployment location, and allows you to customize where these locations sit. You can move your forces before of an invasion. Maybe having the orbital ion cannon on the front line isn't such a good idea. To gauge where the enemy would likely come from, look for the landing beacon locations that denote likely enemy LZs, where they will gather their forces before pushing towards the base. Do note the location of base power generators, as these are deployed alongside shield generators and turbo lasers. If they're destroyed, those systems will cease to function, so it is imperative to defend these buildings if you want those systems to remain online. Lastly, the planetary info button, which will give you a much of the same information, including potential weather types. It'll also give you a historical perspective on the planet's history and wildlife. You may not think much of this, but it comes in handy. Some worlds are more hostile than you might think. The Rebel Alliance is, at its core, a collection of worlds and institutions set on removing the Empire from power and restoring the democratically elected Republic. We are not a group of loosely affiliated cells of terrorists, as the Imperial propaganda would have you believe. At least, not fully. Many full, legitimate, sovereign worlds support this cause. With the destruction of the Death Star, many worlds went public and withdrew from the Empire. They are now under grave threat by Imperial reprisal, and to put it bluntly, the Rebellion cannot protect every world. At least, not yet. 
It is your job as a rebel commander to win battles that you can and minimize the casualties where you can't, to establish a supply chain and work with the forces you have to fight back a largely superior military force. To do this, you'll need to establish strategies to take advantage of your ships and vehicles and soldiers' unique aspects and talents. As the Rebellion, we lack the heavy weapons platforms of Imperial ISDs and the pure massive numbers of its starfighters, but we make up for this for high-quality starfighters, faster, more maneuverable cruisers, and a mix of dozens of races, research, and development. But the Empire is not sitting around. Its war machine is always building new weapons and training Imperial Army and Stormtrooper platoons, while its weapon research divisions are developing new technologies to stop our cause. Key pace, the Alliance has enlisted the help of a number of sympathetic groups, including well-known INCOM Corporation scientists and engineers that developed the T-65 X-Wing Superiority Fighter. To keep these scientists working, they need adequate facilities to do their work. They need research stations. These stations are a massive investment, and more so, they're lightly armored and armed. If they're destroyed, we'll lose access to higher level technology, at least until it can be replaced in a more secure region. So keep that in mind when investing in global technology. Location and defense is key. If on the other hand, you manage to find an Imperial R&D facility, do not hesitate to destroy it. Anything to slow the Imperial weapon research is a good thing for the Alliance. Mission log updated. The old adage goes that the galaxy spins on credits. This is true for the Empire as it is for the Rebellion. Every soldier requires food, training, weapons, and equipment. Starfighters and capital ships cost credits. Some credits come from currently occupied worlds noted with a plus, while other worlds with high production or the cost for maintaining high-end defensive structures can actually bring a world's income into the negatives, such as Hoth, that ion cannon and shield generator don't pay for themselves. Keep an eye on your structure's weekly upkeep. You can get a full list of your faction's costs by putting your mouse over the weekly credit income. Some structures enhance a world's current credit generation, such as the Supply Depot which takes the place of the Rebel Camp, the most basic Rebel structure a world can have. The Supply Depot will increase the income a planet can generate using a multiplier listed, while also giving a flat bonus to the overall amount. It'll also give any passing friendly freighter an increase to the income generation that it provides as it moves supplies between Rebel commands. Once built, the Supply Depot also opens up construction options in orbit, such as the YT-1300 freighter as well as a ground facility called a garrison post to help defend the mostly defenseless supply depot. The supply depot ready. can further be Copy upgraded sir. to a manufacturing base, which increases the planet's income by four times and adds another flat bonus to the planet's general income and allows for the production of the heroic GR-75 medium freighter. These freighters, like the YT-1300, will move about friendly systems, generating credits based on the planets visited and the distance traveled. With these upgrades, worthless systems can become moderate credit generation hubs, while high-value worlds can produce significantly more credits. Looking over the map, you're probably wondering about the glowing yellow worlds, the dark bold lines, the red lines, and the green. Well, the green indicates Imperial planets and secured Imperial routes. White indicates unknown or unsecured hyperlands. Red are rebel routes, and yellow lines are black sun known areas of operation. Glowing yellow planets are planets with black sun corruption. It gives the criminal organization certain benefits. This can only be removed by sending a retrieval operative or certain heroes to find the inflicting units and uproot them. These specialized Moving officers ahead. are trained at Alliance Location Intelligence confirmed. Centers, Removing of which we can corruption. find one here on Bothala. This center can also train Alliance envoys to make contact with those sympathetic to our cause. Sending these envoys to valuable worlds will help divert funds from Imperial and criminal operations to our own coffers. Just train the unit, drag them to the planet you want to deploy them on, and then release them on the gather support spot. As your military grows, you'll need to grow your network of stations and ground bases to support it, represented largely by the unit capacity in the lower left. Building sympathizer outposts will raise the unit cap by 10, shown here as well as building planetary warehouses and intelligence centers. But keep in mind, the more of these facilities you build, the less space you'll have for defensive structures, income generating bases, and of course, training and vehicle factories. Your strategy and playstyle should dictate the balance here. Lots of cheap units in mass may bring victory, but require a large support structure for all those personnel and naval assets. Space combat always starts in two ways. Either you're attacking or defending. Attacking requires you to stack a fleet into a single orbital slot. I recommend adding a single unit here to act as your pathfinder, as I call them. 
This unit will arrive before the rest, allowing the fleet to survey right, the battlefield that. before calling the right assets from hyperspace. Because you're attacking, you get to dictate the opening terms of the engagement. In space, both sides are limited to a certain number of units that can safely be brought into a battle. This is your unit cap. Once reached, you won't be able to bring in any more of your reinforcements until your current forces take losses. This is true for the defending force as well, but unlike the attacker, if the defenders have forces in reserve, they did not get to choose what units are on location at the start of the battle. So, if you see an enemy ship drop out of hyperspace mid-battle, you know these are reserve units. These units can be located in the Call for Reinforcements tab located here. Once clicked, a red gridded area will be revealed showing unsafe areas for the fleet to drop out of hyperspace. You must drop in a safe location inside current sensor range. This is why I always bring in a vessel with strong sensors or a ship with an attached scout squadron, such as the Nebulon B and its attached long probe Y-wing scouts. Some areas may be red because of other reasons, such as they're too close to a static structure, which is a space station, or a ship is generating a gravity well. Each side in a conflict can retreat from battle at any time, unless an interdictor has been deployed to the battlefield. To fall back first, the Nava computers and hyperdrives must be ready. This is represented by a timer located here, which starts ticking down as soon as the battle starts. Once the hyperdrives have had a chance to cool off, you, Commander, can choose to order a retreat. Starting the calculations and alignment for an entire fleet to hyperspace takes time. Be warned, while the Nava computer is calculating, your ships will be vulnerable to enemy fire. Now this is key. The Rebellion has worked very hard to see that every ship in the fleet can calculate jumps faster than standard. This time has been dropped down to 8 seconds compared to the Empire's standard 12 seconds and the Black Sun's rumored 10 seconds. Each second in combat is an eternity, so use this to your advantage for hit and run attacks. So how do we win battles? Well, every battle's outcome is determined by three things. Planning, position, and capability. I'll refer to this as we continue. Once you've committed to a battle, take a close look at your individual units. Each has a strength and a weakness. It's your job to use these assets to their full potential. In space combat, ships have roles to fill. Be it a CR-90's natural strength as a screening ship with its dual heavy laser cannons, or the famed Liberty-style winged MC-80 battleship capable of taking substantial punishment to its Mon Cala built shields, protecting other vulnerable ships from sustained fire. Planning dictates what you bring to the battlefield, so think through what strategies might be possible with the current fleet makeup, or what kind of fleets that you can form up. Each ship's weapons has an effective range and are only effective against certain targets. For example, massive turbo lasers of an IST's main batteries are great at applying sustained fire to large targets, but will struggle to keep up and track smaller vessels like the blockade runner, or worse, any fighter-sized ship. But that same IST will be able to use those large turbo lasers at far greater ranges, outranging and outdamaging many other capital ships and frigate-class vessels. The same Imperial Star Destroyer has a major weakness, its aft section. Main cannons can't cover its flank and its maneuverability is severely limited. Those same frigates of ours can flank an ISD and fire largely unimpeded without proper cover. Positioning is key. Even fighters have different strengths that fit into specific roles. A mission to take out a capital ship's subsystems can be accomplished well with Y-Wings using proton torpedoes, but an A-Wing will have trouble scratching anything larger than a starfighter with its weapons. Though an X-Wing with its twin light protons won't be able to do as much damage as a dedicated bomber, its multi-purpose role as a superiority fighter make it a valuable asset when used correctly. Keeping your fighter wings out of flak and screening escorts or making holes in the enemy fleet's formation so that they can apply their firepower unimpeded against proper targets will get you far. This is capability. Making sure your armored vessels are the focus of the enemy combatants, your bombers aren't intercepted, and your missile jamming Nebulon Bs in the position to jam enemy ordnance, this is how you win battles. Having the right ship, in the right fleet, in the right position. We'll go into more detail in the next video in this series. On the defense for a space battle, you get whatever you have in orbit. Defense stations, of course shipyard stations, are key to holding your territory. Shipyards, as of 2.9, are weak combat stations that have battle groups attached to them. The higher the level shipyard, the more impressive the fleet defending. Some stations have special abilities or research to help customize your current force for the engagement. One exception to this is ground-to-orbit weapon systems, such as the Ion Cannon or Imperial Hypervelocity Cannon, which can be used in battle by defending forces to target capital ships in orbit. This is 
one of the only times where a ground station can affect a space battle. Ground battles. Traditional doctrine dictates an orbital force must be cleared before a ground invasion can commence. But the Rebel Alliance is not a traditional force. We'll talk about raids later. Once a defending force is cleared from orbit, ground forces can be landed. Everything mentioned about space combat maintains its relevancy in ground engagements. Pathfinder position will be the first boots on the ground. If your orbital force has bombers and capital ship support with orbital strike capability listed here, your ground forces will have bombing runs and turbo laser bombardment as an option. These assets take time to get in position and properly targeted. You can see the progress of your bombers here and orbital support here, if you've got it. The type of bombers used will be dictated by what you have in orbit. Landing zones are indicated on your mini-map as a triangle. These LZs are drop points for reinforcements and also fallback points. If you decide a situation is untenable, call for a full retreat. Keep in mind, any unit not in an LZ won't be evacuated on the transports that are sent, and they will be lost to the enemy. Your units will attempt to make their way back to the nearest LZ on their own once this order has been given. There's no guarantee that they'll make it in time. Battle information is listed on the right-hand side, giving you an overview of your current victory conditions and notable mission-relevant data, such as local friendly forces and potential credit bonus for victory. Friendly forces show up on your map, just like as if you had to train them yourself. Like the local militia here on Jabim, these people are willing to fight for their homes, in this case against the mercenaries and criminals affiliated with the Black Sun. Each map has a variety of capturable installations, such as old abandoned droid works from the Clone Wars, mercenary team headquarters for hiring local help, or defense points, known as build pads, that allow for anti-tank and anti-infantry turrets to be constructed, even AA weapons if you deem them necessary to help hold ground. These are great force multipliers, do not underestimate them. There is a larger variant of these build pads called strategic points that give far more interesting defensive structures. Sensor array, bigger anti-air with larger coverage, and even medical supplies such as Bacta to help keep infantry fighting. Just like in space battles, your unit cap and free enforcements work in a similar way. Maxing out will keep you from dropping more units until you lose some of the current force. There is one major difference though. In space, dropping units out of hyperspace gives them a massive debuff for a few seconds due to the power draw that hyperspace travel takes on your ship's defenses. Basically, dropping into combat can open your vessel up to substantial damage. On the ground, it's the reverse. Landing craft carrying troops are armed and will cover your men and equipment by doing damage to enemy units too close to the LZ. This can be used to your advantage, but be warned. Bunched up friendly units are in a precarious position when leaving transports, so weigh out if it's worth dropping reinforcements to a hot landing zone. Let's talk about raids. Raids are a rebel's best friend, but a full-scale army can't do without a fleet. A small group of highly trained individuals can do quietly. When prepping for a raid, you'll need stealth units, denoted by this icon. Some examples are the militia commandos under General Kota, trained on this very ship, heroes such as Solo and his Wookiee co-pilot, Bothan Probe Scouts. This symbol What's simply means mind? this unit can move through the galaxy unnoticed without triggering a battle as long as they move as individuals. Once you have a few stacks of these units over a world, start a battle with them in the usual way by dragging them to the planet. This is a great tactic for taking small, barely defended backline worlds or for attempting to soften a fleet's defenses by destroying key structures like the Imperial Hypervelocity Cannon. Taking a world like this won't harm the orbital fleet, but it will destroy the stations in orbit. It's great for weakening a heavily fortified position. We'll talk more about sieging defended worlds later on in a second video. Missions. Back on the main galactic map, throughout the campaign, Rebel High Command will issue missions for you to complete. These missions can be as simple as gathering intel on a local sector, overseeing the construction of factories and training facilities, or destroying certain logistical targets. Completing issued missions will net you rewards, such as new units that can't be trained, reinforcements, credits, and more. It's advantageous to complete these missions as Mon Mothma and those higher in the food chain will offer more valuable missions and rewards for those with a strong track record of getting things done. There are still dozens of topics that I'd like to discuss, so we're gonna have to hold back as this video is already far too long for part two. In part two of the series, we'll go in depth on rebel vehicles and equipment and some basic strategies to help you win the war. If you have comments or criticism, drop them in the description below. I will see you all in the field. Good luck, may the force be with you.